Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. I always enjoy coming and speaking to, uh, to Dan's classes. So, um, like Dan said, my name is Jared. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Link Jar Media. And um, I'm here today just to talk to you a little bit about this word called inbound marketing. Um, the show of hands, how many of you have heard of inbound marketing? Okay. So it's a, it, it's a fancy term for, for digital marketing. And we'll get into um, maybe some of the nuances and differences. Um, before we do that, I want to kind of give you my background and talk to you about Talk to you a little bit about myself, how I got started, uh, what caused me to start Link Jar, where we are today, that sort of thing, give you some context and perspective. Um, before I begin, please, this is very, I like the conversation to be very informal, so rather than me standing up here kind of you know, preaching, I'd rather you guys it'd be more interactive and when you have a question, just stop me and ask, because I think that's how we'll learn better together. Um, so I uh, came from the traditional advertising background, sort of uh, incestual in the sense that I started at the local Fox affiliate here, and then I moved over to WAFB and sold television advertising there. And then after about 10 years, moved over to WBRZ to manage the sales team there and do national sales. Um, it was a extremely beneficial um, experience for me. It taught me um, so much as far as how business works, how advertising works or doesn't work. And um, it also kind of introduced me into the world of digital marketing. So I, um, you know, I reached the age of 40 with family and two kids and I got to a point where I said, okay, <clears throat> Is this what I want to do the rest of my life? Because you know, more and more of my conversations with clients and, and business owners were shifting away from you know their TV commercial and more towards the web, whether it was their website or social media or uh, web promotions. And I had an extreme interest in that. I kind of saw that handwriting on the wall. So I took a step out and started Link Jar in uh, 2000, beginning of 2012. And um, from day one, our specialty was inbound marketing. And um, I truly believe my background in the traditional world of advertising gave me tremendous perspective in where the world was going, where the consumer was going most importantly. And I'm sure you guys today already know that, but back you know, early 2012, it was still kind of uh, evolving, right? And um, so when I started Link Jar, it was just me uh, at my kitchen table. And what I, what I told myself is, I'm going to do everything for Blink Jar that I tell my clients to do. And so I started blogging like crazy, creating content that was helpful and resourceful to those who needed it took all of my knowledge that I've learned over the last 15 years and just basically zoned in and put all of that effort into inbound marketing and growing link to our media, just like any business should be grown today. Um, and it's worked. Um, over the last 10 years, we've had a nice, slow, steady growth, and that's the way we did that on purpose because I've seen way too many agencies like ours They'll add a client or two, and then they'll go out and hire four or five, 10 people. And before you know it, that client's gone, and then they have to let go of those four or five, 10 people. So that's not a that's not an algorithm that I like. And so we've had a nice, steady growth. We have uh, 10 um, team members now and growing, plus an intern. So um, we have clients that I would say 50% of our clients are based here in the Baton Rouge area, and then the other 50 are from all over the, the nation 
kind of anywhere from Boston to Seattle to Dallas to North Carolina. So um, when I get into this and we talk about inbound marketing, you'll realize, and I didn't realize this at the time, but there would have been no way Blinkjar would have those clients um, if it were not for the inbound methodology and what we do. Uh, we wouldn't be known by those clients. We wouldn't have been found by those clients. And we sure wouldn't be able to service those clients. So we're extremely fortunate to be in this uh, situation. So inbound marketing, in a nutshell, is, um, is sort of the opposite of the traditional advertising, right? So in television, when I was selling uh, television ads, we'd go to a car dealer or attorney, uh, furniture dealer, you name it, and we would talk to them about their business and we would try to grow their business through advertising. The challenge with traditional advertising, even back then, was that it was a, a broad medium that would cast a wide net and there was a tremendous amount of waste, right? And so you would advertise most of the time ineffectively because the people that you were speaking with had no interest in your product or service. And so there was a ton of um, waste. Um, and it also was extremely hard for the business owner or manager to track any of the results or efforts. So um, a lot of times, most of the time, you know, I was on 100% um, commission. I would walk in the door of a car dealer who was spending forty or fifty thousand dollars a month on television advertising with me, and my, you know, my dependency on the success of that uh, of that campaign was extremely uh, stressful because they could cancel at any time, and there went my paycheck and putting food on the table. So. I always go in and I would kind of hesitantly ask, so how was your advertising this month? How did it work? And it's almost like after you ask that question, you go, like, uh, because you didn't want to hear the answer, right? Nine times out of the 10, the answer was something like, eh, I don't know, uh, my cousin said they saw the ad. Uh, we sold a few cars, I guess, I guess it's kind of working. So there was sort of this uh, missing ingredient, this sort of uh, missing part of the, the loop or the cycle um, that really was never, we, we were never able to close with traditional advertising. It was not trackable. People could not bring their TV in and say, hey, we saw your ad, uh, we, want this, we want this car. And so, um, you know, inbound marketing, so that, Traditional advertising is what they coin outbound marketing. Whether you're in the market or not for a product or service, you're getting that message, it's outbound, it's coming to you, right? And for the most part, it's wasteful. I mean, there's it's, it's sort of lucky if you if you fall on some, some ears that want to hear it. Um, but inbound marketing is more, um, it's more, uh, uh, push more uh, pull marketing where the consumer is like reverse advertising. The consumer is the one in control of the messaging uh, through Google search, through social media, through their social network, through reviews. Um, everything that we're exposed to today um, in the cycle of marketing and advertising is what we consider more inbound because basically what you're doing is you're creating helpful, resourceful information. You're not giving any trade secrets away, but you are giving out information before you get anything of value back. And so, whereas advertising was more outbound and they were basically knocking on your door and spending money to get you to, it was salesy. They wanted you to come in and spend money, right? And it was a, it, they wanted to hit the home run right away. Come in, buy this Toyota Corolla for $19,999 today, right? Whether you're in the market for Corolla or not, you're getting that message. Inbound is taking a more um, thoughtful approach in how you market your business. So we have clients that um, are 
in the medical field. We have clients that are B2B, you know, they're in the business to business industry. And uh, we have other clients that are in um, like the home um, service area, like roofers or um, interior decorators or uh, remodeling companies. Um, and so all of those companies, what we do is we sit down and put a plan together that looks at things like how they're ranking on Google search, you know, um, is their website uh, modern and effective in um, driving traffic and converting leads um, and converting those leads to customers and are they doing it in a informal or uh, informative way rather than in a salesy approach because Today's consumer is too smart to fall for all of those gimmicky, um, you know, traditional advertising things. Um, and so you have to be uh, much more um, strategic in your approach when um, taking the inbound marketing um, methodology. And so what you're trying to do is basically build relationships with potential clients or customers through your content creation, your offers, your information. Um, and it's basically taking the approach of you're giving before you get. You're giving with the notion of you may not ever turn this potential, uh, this prospect into a customer. Uh, but that's okay because there'll be others that will come as customers and it will benefit from the information that you are um, pushing out. And so we, when we sit down with clients, um, before we do anything, we show them this, um, this flywheel. And in marketing and advertising, it used to be called the customer funnel. You know, you were top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. They had terms for it. It was like tofu, mofu, and bofu. Top of the funnel, bottom, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. And all that really meant was where is the customer in the journey to purchasing your product or service? Or are they just finding out about you and just kind of doing the discovery? That would be top of the funnel. Or are they, have they discovered what product or service they want, but they're just not really sure um, if it's right for them or if they want to make a decision right now, that's more middle of the funnel, funnel or who they, want to, who they want to use is middle of the funnel. Bottom of the funnel is, I know what I want, I know who I want to use, now it's time to get down to what the price is and make that purchase, right? So nothing necessarily wrong with the funnel, but it's sort of antiquated because now in today's world, we have what's called the flywheel. And the flywheel is basically turning the funnel on its back. And what it means is because when the funnel, with the funnel, what it meant was once that person became a consumer, they were done, right? They moved on, you're going to the next one. You know, you caught that fish, they're going, let's go catch some more. The flywheel is a continuous loop, right? And if you ignore that customer, you're in trouble today, right? Just go ask a bunch of doctors that get bad reviews or, um, you know, go talk to the car dealer that keeps getting negative reviews. Um, they'll find out pretty quickly that if they ignore the customer, they're ignoring them at their own peril because in today's world, the consumer's voice is much bigger than the company's voice. They have so much, uh, uh, they just have so many ways to kind of voice their frustrations. Um, and usually it is the loud squeaky wheel that sort of are the ones that do it. Whereas before, with traditional advertising, there was no mechanism, there was no voice for the consumer, right? If you had an unpleasant experience, what do you do? You know, write to the best, Better Business Bureau. That's about it. Uh, let us know how that works. So, uh, with this new kind of flywheel method, and, you know, Amazon's the one honestly, that created this whole flywheel method and they're the perf they're perfectionists at it. They've done it, such a good job with it. 
Um, I think it was Jeff Bezos' baby where you, you, you know, with Amazon, it's, it's constantly taking care of the customer, the consumer, um, because that relationship never ends. And if you do it the right way, your customers will become your biggest champions. They'll become your biggest disciples. And people always ask me, well, how do you get your clients? There's two ways we get our clients. One, we do the inbound marketing methodology ourselves. So whatever we tell our clients and customers to do, we're doing it for our agency as well. So it's you know social media, it's SEO, it's creating content, all of those things. But also what we're striving to do, we're not perfect, but what we do benefit from is when we do a good job with our customers, they're our biggest, we have two or three clients that just keep giving us clients. And I'm like, I need to put you on payroll because you guys are so nice to us and so good. That voice becomes really, really loud, right? They become the loudest, the biggest champion for your company when you when you service them the right way. So obviously those are, it's easier said than done, but companies that, that take that delight stage um, usually usually win. So with the inbound, with this flywheel inbound methodology, basically you have three stages. You have the attract stage, the engage stage, and the delight stage. And so the theory behind this is, um, with the attract stage, is you look at things that companies are doing. When we sit down with them, I'll look at these three buckets and I'll try to isolate where their problem is. Sometimes they're getting a ton of traffic, so it's not in the attract stage. They're getting traffic to their website and they're getting people through their doors, but they're not converting. So meaning those, those customers are bouncing out, they're walking out. So we need to look at the engage stage and see why. Um, other times they're, they're getting them in, they're closing them, they're getting them as customers, but then they have a terrible delight stage and they have a bad perception, bad brand, if you will, and it's very hurtful, um, and that's hard to kind of reverse. Um, in the attract stage, though, it's usually, they're, most of the time, they're either newer, or they just don't know what to do to attract the right uh, prospects to their website, or through their door, or getting to pick up the phone and call. And so, you know, the key here is to try to uh, put together a strategy that will attract the right people, get their attention, and not be salesy or forceful. So some of those deliverables, if you will, or action points with the attract stages are things like, you know, are you blogging? Are you creating content? Is your company looking at SEO, um, which is really, really important, which is search engine optimization? Where are you? On, in the search engines compared to your competitors. Um, social publishing, are you, are you actively on social media or is, has your last post been three years ago? Um, that's, you know, in the consumer's mind, that's important. Um, paid search, are you doing any type of paid search on Google or Bing and display advertising, or are you doing any type of, of display advertising? You don't have to do all of these. You do the ones that obviously make sense for you and your company. Um, but it's important when you're struggling as a new company um, <clears throat> to take care of those strategies and implement them so that you can start attracting the right uh, prospects. Um, I'll give you an example of, of one that um, we, we worked with uh, this is Barrett Distribution, and they are a third-party logistics company. They're nationwide. They have warehouses all over the nation, um, East Coast, West Coast, Memphis, all over. And um, a lot of companies, when we first started working with Barrett in 2013, um, they were hesitant to do anything. They didn't do traditional advertising, and they were hesitant to even do this inbound marketing stuff. Um, and 
you know, they thought their business was too boring and no one cared. And that is probably the biggest mistake I see companies make. It's like, well, no one's interested in X, Y, Z. No one wants to know about that. That is the worst assumption in the world because <clears throat> any prospect, especially in B2B, when they're thinking about investing in a, uh, for, for Barrett, they're a third party logistics provider. So what that means is they'll work with any type of retailer around the world really on doing all the logistics stuff for them, holding their stuff in warehouses, delivering it, transporting it, all of the stuff that if you take that out of your wheelhouse as a company, you can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in many headaches. So they'll do it for you type of thing. And so when businesses are looking for that, nine times out of 10, the first thing they're going to do is search that out, right? Because they're unfamiliar with it. Again, they're going to be searching. They're on the top of the funnel, right? We go back to the funnel approach. They're starting their search and their discovery. And you as a company, as a third party logistics company, want to be um, a part of that, right? You want to be in the game. And so the way we did that was through content creation. And you can see this is hard to see, I know, and I apologize. This is only the last two years, but if we are three years. If you have, you know, back to 2013, this is, these columns are reflective of their traffic, their web traffic. And so what we have been doing for the last seven or so years is creating content like crazy that not just to create content, but we're really strategic about it. So we, um, they have probably uh, seven or eight real specific niches that they, that they serve. So uh, third party logistics for footwear, third party logistics for automotive products, uh, parts, third party logistics for cosmetics. Take those examples and then start diving deep into what questions do people have about hiring a third party logistics company for footwear. And so what you start to what you start to see is basically and this is where sales can come in and others that are customer facing can come in. What are some of the questions that people are asking you? over and over and over and so they're blue in the face and you're blue in the face for answering it and it's not necessarily trade secrets but it's information that's important to the end user and right now it's not on your site what can we do to answer all of those questions and so it's sort of a, a approach that they ask you answer and the reason we do that is because if the customer is asking you as the company about your services, guess who else they're asking? Competitors. Competitors, one. Probably even more important than competitors. They're asking Google. So if you think about it in that sense, there's thousands of questions that people ask on a daily basis to these companies. And so when you start to answer those questions, either in a blog format or on pillar pages, what starts to happen is you become the authoritative source for third party logistics and footwear. Yeah. So with, I guess, the inbound marketing, it seems like on y'all's end, it's a lot of information and data. Is that being purchased from the set Googles and Facebooks or whatnot, or how, how not, is that information so I not, transferred to y'all? Yeah, great question. So it's not it's not purchased. We have we do have software. One's called SimRush, SEMrush. Uh, HubSpot's helpful as well. Uh, we have products that can. I mean, Google has uh, uh, planners, and basically, what you can do is you can basically take monthly searches and see what people are searching for, um, and they'll carve it out by volume. And so. Uh, it, you have to take a strategic approach here. Um, I'll give you an example. We had a personal injury attorney who would go unnamed. Um, I call it the golfing syndrome. He had the golfing syndrome. He went golfing with his buddies. And his buddies said, hey, XYZ, I noticed you're not ranked for um, personal injury attorney. 
Baton Rouge. Why is that? So he gets back to the office, he calls me, and he says, why aren't we running for personal injury attorney in Baton Rouge? So part of the research for this example is to go in and see what are your monthly searches for personal injury attorney in Baton Rouge. You can imagine everyone that is a personal attorney in Baton Rouge that are you know, probably thousands of them in the area. That's probably the most important one for them to be ranked, right? But it's also the most difficult for them to rank because uh, there's, not to get into too much, um, too far into the weeds, but there's this thing called domain authority and, and how long you've had your domain. Are you authoritative in that source, in that content? Have you been creating that content for a long, long time? And if you're going up against a company that's ranked on the first page, they're more than likely have carved that niche out and have staked that claim years ago. And so you can write all you want about personal injury attorney Baton Rouge until you blew in the face, but you're not going to outrank that competitor. So you've got to be smart about it. So what we try to tell people is don't go after that one term that you'll never rank for. Go after the 50 others that are what we call long tail keywords, more specific. Could be, um, this is just an example, um, personal injury attorney for motorcycle accidents and bad damage. Personal injury attorneys for um, businesses in Baton Rouge. Um, longer tail, more specific, less volume, but guess what? More quality. So when someone's searching that specific niche, they're gonna be way more qualified for you as a business than someone who's just generically typing in personal injury attorney Baton Rouge. It could be anything. And half the time, believe me, They'll call in and the attorneys will complain because, oh, this is a wasted case. They, they don't, this is fraudulent, this blah, 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 blah. Well, that's because you're just ranking for personal injury attorney down the route. Be specific, be more long tail, take that approach. You'll end, end up winning every day on it. And so we took that same approach with various distributions. So we started blogging and creating uh, an optimization strategy that was based around their niches. So third-party logistics for footwear, third-party logistics for cosmetics, third-party logistics for auto parts. And guess what? Now, anytime you Google it, they're going to be on the front, first page. More than likely, they're going to be the first rank. Organically speaking, not paid. We'll get to that, and we'll get to those differences in a second. But these companies like Barrett, all they need is one lead. They'll get 150 a month, and only 10 of them are worth it. But if they just get one to become a customer, that's sometimes over a million dollars in, in revenue, right? And that's paid for their inbound marketing for about, I don't know, 20 years. So uh, it's to, to take this approach, with uh, a company like this, it's extremely beneficial um, for them, and their business has exploded over the last uh, seven years or so. And I think one of the things to kind of follow up on that point is that a lot of times, like you're saying, companies look at it as, oh, we're boring, we're B2B, yep. you know, we, we don't have to do this, or we don't yep. think it's a good investment, but when you're talking about clients that will spend a million dollars plus per account, and with that, coupled with some of the things you're saying about bad and injury attorneys, where it's yep. just saturated, there's a lot of B2B spaces where nobody's doing this. Yep. So if you can get in there early as one of the authorities, it's also relatively easy as opposed to more B2C environment where everyone's already doing this, to get in and make a huge impact and get the traffic more, more easily. So you can attract it more easily and get bigger conversions and it's really just an untapped resource, I think, for a lot oh, of Oh, you hit the nail on the head. And to your point, I'll give you a real day example. So right before the pandemic, about a year before, we had a guy who was a referral from Barrett. He's in Boston. He calls me up and he says, heard you've done a good job for Barrett. We want to do what Barrett's doing, but I am in the labor laboratory science uh, 
relocation business. It's like, okay, <laughs> like, oh gosh. <laughs> and super smart guy, imagine just, and, and he's like, we're having a real hard time attracting anyone to our site. We do really good work. We're proud of what we do. We're in Boston. We're in the, the form, pharmaceutical medical mecca of the nation. Keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic. And he's like, I just want to do some of the inbound stuff. I think that will work. And it's okay. We'll put a strategy together. Long story short, we started doing uh, some things we were talking about. And we built sort of a, we built some equity in the content, right? He started ranking. He started outranking some of the big. That's the other beautiful thing about inbound marketing. You're on an evil level with the small companies with the big companies. Whereas in advertising, it's about the size of your wallet. In inbound marketing, it's about the size of your brain. So if you outwork and outthink the bigger competitors by doing some of the things we're talking about, you'll outpace them and you'll start ranking ahead of them. It's not about how much money they spend. So this guy took the inbound approach and started create, we started creating content for him around everything around laboratory relocations, you know, how a third party company will save the money. Why should a, a laboratory manager hire a, a, a relocation company? What are the benefits? What are the blah, 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 right? Then the pandemic hits. Guess what? Everyone, especially in the Boston, he's got Moderna, he's got all these companies that are just moving in, creating all of these labs. And he's, he's just getting leads left and right. And now I talked to him a week ago because we have a meeting every other week. He's like, I can't even meet with you because he's like, we're getting so big. He's like, we're getting, we're growing so fast. It's starting to hurt us because he can't hire enough people. So that's the effect when you do it the right way that inbound marketing can have um, on your business. The, um, the next stage after attract is engage. So I would say this is a, a, a big one that I see a lot where we meet with companies and they say, we're getting all kind of traffic. We get X, Y, Z amount of traffic all the time. People know us and they come to our site, or, you know, but we're not really getting anything out of the web. We're not really um, doing much with the, with the web and with inbound marketing, really don't know what to do. And so a lot of times the, the problem becomes we're getting the traffic to our site now what, right? Like, what do we do? Um, and so it's sort of taking that, that inbound approach again and not being salesy and having things like instantly like, you know, purchase today or you know, make an appointment now. Um, you want to nurture um, leads that come or traffic that comes to your site. And the way you nurture anyone is by giving them what they want and what they're interested in. And so um, you need to make sure from a strategic standpoint that you're doing that at every level of that old funnel. So you need to have information that's more top of the funnel and offers that are more top of the funnel. It could be, um, you know, it could be tips for uh, hiring a third party logistics company. Um, and it could be very kind of high level, um, but you offer that to them, right? It could be a white paper or ebook or a, a video, and you offer that to them so that you can start to engage with them. And you're not saying, hey, buy from me today. You're actually just kind of dangling a carrot, if you will, and saying, hey, you want to find out more? And I'm sure as consumers, you guys have all been a part of this, you've all downloaded things, you've all, you've probably, if you're interested in the company and you don't want to talk to someone right away, you may um, download something or you may subscribe to their newsletter or whatever it may be. The whole point is having these micro conversions. In other words, you're not trying to get a home run, you're just trying to get them to kind of join your, your group and um, you know, then once they join, you can start to nurture them with other um, 
contextually similar um, information on your on those same services and products. So, um, you know, we have a local orthopedic in, in town, and if someone's downloading something on knee injuries, they're probably not necessarily interested in a newsletter letter on ankles or on shoulders, right? But companies do that all the time. You're like, why are they sending me this stuff? I'm not interested in it, right? It's not in my wheelhouse. I'm having knee surgery. Why am I getting a shoulder email? And so many people violate that, and it's because it's the easy thing to do. But the best thing in the world is to segment your audience based on interest and start to market to them on their interest. Um, so in other words, in that example, obviously the only information you would want to send to them is further information on knee injuries instead of just kind of blasting out information to them. And so that's why database segmentation is so important is because you want to be smart about how you're working with people, right? And at the end of the day, the consumer is smart also, and they're not going to fall for these antiquated strategies. Yes? On that point, um, so I don't know if you'd agree, but do you think we're kind of in the golden age of inbound marketing? Now, we were just doing a case study about how you market beer back in 2005, and we're like, I think Facebook was just starting then. Yeah. You know, YouTube was around. Yeah. Uh, that compared to how would you market beer now? Yeah. What what happens when the customers just keep getting wise to it, and we're just giving so much? Like, can you do you have a crystal ball, or have you ever thought what more could we really do than what we're doing now? Yeah. As far as the, the beer example, uh, or just not, in general? Not beer, but in general, I mean, the, I guess the way that the big data is going, we're going to know so much about the question customers have, what do you see in just the next five years for inbound marketing as, you know, or, or do you have any thought leaders that you're following? Well, I, first of all, if I had that answer, I think I'd probably be on the beach somewhere. <laughs> I can give you my best. Still, um, still call me back. To yeah, yeah, I'll call you. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come <laughs> speak next week. Uh, but I do, I will say this, the consumer is always one step ahead of marketers and businesses. Right. And so when inbound marketing was big and exploding, um, you know, they are, those marketing companies were following what the consumer was doing. In other words, in the 2006, 7, 8, when social was getting big and you started to have all these companies like Netflix getting bigger and bigger and you could block out advertising messages, you had satellite radio, you had Spotify, all of those things were growing. And now we're kind of in an age where everyone knows that now and it's that next level. And so what I would say is there are things that are happening now. I'm not saying that this is the golden egg or where everything's going, but you have to follow the consumer. So an example is a lot of consumers now don't even want to download things. They want to get to the point and they'll do either a chat or they'll even text or, uh, you know, however they feel comfortable with communicating um everyone's different i know like my 14 year old son he doesn't speak to me i'm like some old dude that just lives <laughs> in the house with him right but if i start texting him he blasts me back and i'm like who the hell is this like who is this dude right he's like talking to me about stuff and i'm like okay i just saw you in the kitchen and you ignored me so Consumers, especially as that generation gets older, we've got to keep in mind like how they like to communicate. I think it's going to be, and I'm not saying the chat is the answer, but you're seeing more and more, and maybe you guys can speak to this as a consumer. Everyone's different, but we've got to be communities of sorts as a company. We've got to start having those avenues of communication for my sons of the world that are getting older that want to just chat or want to text or want a Facebook message or whatever it is, right? We've got to be communities of sort and start to adapt to that. And I think that's where you're going to see uh, most of these companies like the HubSpots and all these marketing SaaS companies, they're developing more answers for 
kind of these all-in-one inboxes where no matter where the consumer is communicating with you, you're getting that message and you're tracking it all in one place, whether it's instant message, whether it's text, whether it's chat, it's all coming into one. Because if you don't, trying to keep up with that in siloed efforts is a nightmare. Yes. But I do think the successful companies moving forward are going to be the ones that develop answers for that and how the consumer, how the consumer communicates. Because again, the consumer's always one step ahead. And the consumer's always like, no, I don't want to download your stupid brochure. I just want to know how much black, 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 black is. And so we've got to adapt to that as companies and say, okay, they don't want to download. Let's give them a chat or let's give them a way to text us, right? However they want to communicate is how we should, we should have the technology to do that. Uh, so kind of piggyback on his question and your comment, uh, is there like fears or concerns in the industry with, I guess, ethics or manipulation with now call it kid, kids who now have access to phones and social media at very young ages when they did in the past to they don't know that they basically built a profile from when they're five years old right. to 25, they're tracked all along. Are there any concerns, I guess, of possibly in the future things moving towards things being unethical of, of being able to manipulate what you know from a kid who's been a, a you've tracked the child for call it 20 years or is that kind of they they know they know the software better than we do growing mm -hmm. up so they can kind of i guess adjust as well so i understand what you're saying i'm just trying to when you say they are you meaning like Marketing softwares, and Google and Facebook, or I, I guess um, digital marketing, and yeah, I guess maybe the the social media groups as well. Yeah. So I think part of what you're saying is the reason why Apple has taken a big dip into the, the privacy era, where they're basically. Um, and I don't want to kind of get on an entire because I, I kind of question their motives there, but they're blocking like third party platforms like Facebook and Google from, from advertising tracking mechanisms and so that we can't track, you know, what a site a person visits. Um, and I'll, get, I'll come a circle back to that in a second because I have some comments on that. But I think, uh, I think that's ever evolving. I know in Europe they have the whole GDPR, or GDRP, whatever, where you've got it, and that's why every site you go to now says, you know, we're using cookies and you have to accept it or whatever or decline. I think those are part of the efforts that are speaking to that. I don't quite have an answer for you on, you know, how we maneuver around, you know, teenagers or younger generation that are smarter and um, you know, or building platforms and things that maybe are um, not ethical. I don't quite know the answer to that. It's really uh, interesting that you're talking about this category. Um, I didn't realize this was happening, but now that you're explaining it, there's a woman on social media, she calls herself a mommy doctor. And I don't know if y'all follow her, but she's, she's local. local. She's local. She works with Baptist Clinic. Yeah. She genius at Baptist Clinic did this. Yep. She records herself talking about the flu, the flu vaccine. She did a lot, like she's really popular about the COVID vaccine. Yep. She does like seasonal information Jeez. about, and so the amount of like people who follow her, I got a word of mouth, like, hey, have you heard about the mommy talk? And I was like, what are you talking about? And when I went to the page, her following is crazy yep. in Baptist Clinic. It's branded Baptist Clinic everywhere. Um, and I know it just had a positive effect. I didn't realize it was content. I was like, oh, I love this content. Yeah. 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 And guess what? She doesn't have to advertise. She doesn't have to spend. And she's got kids. Her kids are her video games. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. Yep. And so she's doing it about marketing, probably without even knowing it. You know, and that's. Has everyone heard of Gary Vee? Yes. Okay. So Gary Vee got to start his dad on a wine shop, like in New York or something. And he was a teenager, and right when the you know internet came out, he started blogging about anything and everything wine related. This wine versus that wine. Then he started doing, I forget the name of it, but he was doing like Gary Vee videos on wine. And he just started, just like 
the example of Krista was saying with the doctor, he was doing that in the wine category, right? And he grew his dad's wine business to a, to a whole nother level. I think it was like the wine library or something like that. Anyway, and that's how Gary V became Gary V. Um, you know, he wasn't always this motivational guru dude. He was a guy, you know, that had, was a, had the entrepreneurial mind to go in and say, I'm going to take my dad's business to another level. And he just started taking his knowledge and his dad's knowledge and just giving it to people. Just being like, if you like this, you know, you want to choose this. And then we see it every day now, right? It's kind of what Chris is saying. You, we see it now and we don't even really think about, oh, you know, that's inbound marketing. Um, but back in 2008, 2009, no one was doing this. Now, everyone's started to jump on the bandwagon, which makes it more difficult because the more people, the more companies that are doing it, the noisier it gets and the harder it gets to kind of differentiate yourself. And so that's why when we take on clients, we're looking at, okay, what is this competition doing? Is this a noisy field? Is it going to be hard for us to produce results? Or is it a guy that's, you know, doing laboratory relocations that nobody is touching that field right now and you're going to get a head start. So it, those are some of the opportunities we look at. Gary B is really big on, uh, if there's a bit of new technology adopted early, if there's an Alexa skill that you can create yep. now, then yep. you need to be fresh on that, you know? Yep. So, uh, yeah. And the reason he wants to be the early adapter is because he says, and he's kind of right away, marketers will eventually destroy everything, right? <laughs> so if you get in on the early <laughs> stage, right, you make your money early and then you get out because then that's probably what's happening with TikTok right now. It's like mm. now everyone's getting a TikTok account. The marketers mm. are trying to advertise on it. And everyone wants to know the latest and greatest technique of advertising on TikTok. And to his point, marketers destroy everything at some point, right? That's why we have a bad name. And so he's like, I get in early, I do my thing, and I get out because eventually the marketers are going to destroy TikTok. We've seen it. Facebook, we've seen it. Twitter, LinkedIn, all of them. So they have a funny video, a TikTok video of like someone from marketing coming down asking the interns to be in a TikTok and like they all disappear because <laughs> they just don't want to touch it right. at all. Yeah. That just reminds me of that. That's exactly right. Yeah. But I think to some extent too, it's it's as those platforms get used by more and more people, the unique advantage that they offer lessons. So the people that are really visionaries that are moving on can see where that next best you know, step is. I remember um, visiting with a friend of mine who worked in, in a startup in San Francisco and they had this like guru that they brought in every few weeks to come in and give them tips. And he was of the mindset that he would work on a project for like, I forget what it was, like three or four weeks. And if it wasn't going anywhere, and didn't get the up, he's like, it's done. We're moving right. on to something yeah. else. Yeah. And so it's incredibly fast-paced in some of these things. I'm looking at you know some of the trends that you're saying about make your money and get out. There was a lady who I went to school with for my MBA who started classymommy.com, which uh -huh. is like this blog site. I, I just checked it. She's still online. But I mean, she supposedly, according to this, has been online since 2006 for the class. Wow, man. So she's had a long time, and I'm sure she's doing a lot of other things yep. with it. Yep. But the longer time goes and the longer people can see what's successful, the the less relative advantage you have because it's not as innovative anymore. If you can see what the technology is, kind of your question, Mike, and see where it's going and be that visionary and do something that nobody else is doing, it gives you that advantage. Right. And that, to your point, Jared, you know, whether it's some blog or Facebook or texting or whatever, seeing the next thing and allowing you to connect better than any other company or competitor can, I think is really in the heart of what that is. You know, yeah. but, you know, being aware and being constantly up to date on the technologies and new advantages is really what keeps you on the forefront of marketing. And I'll tell you this, whatever business you're in, my recommendation so we do it for link to our two and it's a very nice feeling is if you if you have the right intentions and you're honestly trying to provide the end user the consumer information helpful information um 
you're going to win in the long run, right? And it's a, it's a good feeling not having to fight the masses and spend a ton of money trying to advertise our agency um, because we're doing the right things and we're, we're following these pra best practices. If you give the consumer what they want, they will find you, right? If you're putting out helpful information, back to her point with the doctor, if you're putting out helpful information, the consumer will find you. Um, and that it's very basic, but it's a lot harder to do than to just say it, you know, because it takes a lot of elbow grease and a lot of uh, grit and determination and thought into how you're going to do it. Uh, this is an example of a company that wasn't having trouble. They're a crane company. They're uh, nationwide, worldwide, really, and they were, weren't having trouble getting people to their site because they're pretty well known. Um, what they were having trouble was with people converting or people engaging with them, right? It's again a, a, a B2B industry. Um, they're basically uh, giving cranes, building cranes for these huge you know, petrochemical projects uh, down the Mississippi River and uh, nationwide. And so their projects are uh, extremely um, you know, important um, and lucrative. Uh, and they were struggling on how to get people to sort of engage with them. And so one of the things just through research and metrics and conversations uh, was that people were coming to their site to see all of their equipment. Like the end user was geeking out about you know, the specs and all this stuff on their equipment. And so what they, they started doing was like gating, so to speak, their big, big equipment. And if you wanted to learn more, get the spec sheet and all that, all you had to do was put in your email address. And you can see we, we started doing that around this hard point, and you can see how the leads have grown since. And it's just a simple tweak. It's nothing like mind-blowing, right? But those are the type of things that you need to look at strategically when you're saying, okay, we've got a ton of people. We've got that track stage perfect. People are coming to our site. Why aren't people converting? Why are we not getting engagement? What are we doing wrong? And sometimes it's the littlest of tweaks that can kind of make the difference. The last uh, stage that uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about is that delight stage. So in the attract stage, you're basically taking strangers and you're giving in helpful information and you're turning them into prospects, right? And in the engage stage, what you're trying to do is take those prospects and turn them into customers, right? And then the delight stage is basically taking those customers and turning them into promoters, champions, disciples, whatever the heck you want to call them, right? And without a doubt, those people will become your best asset um, in the company. Um, it's not even close. Right? Inbound marketing doesn't even compare to this kind of, call it word of mouth on steroids, right? Because our sales cycle diminishes extremely, like the, the, the sales cycle of someone that was referred to us is minuscule compared to someone that's just coming off the street or maybe found us on the web and just kind of doing research, it's 90 day. Um, they already kind of have the trust and have the faith that you're gonna take care of them because someone that they trust and know well has recommended them, um, just like anything else in life. But but we, we forget that in the, in the business world and we, we still have that sort of antiquated, well, they're a customer, so let's not, let's not pay attention to them. Right? Let's move on. Let's go catch the next fish. And that's a, a huge mistake, especially in this day and age, because the consumer's voice is so large now and it's amplified. And you guys can see that across the web, whether it's in 
reviews or net promoter score surveys or you know anything you name it the consumer has ways to kind of both voice their pleasure and displeasures of uh, your company and so you want to focus on creating some buzz around your brand and making sure that you know things like social mentions even or um, I've seen it where um, the consumer expects if they write something like on Twitter or on social media and ask them a question, they're expecting an answer pretty quickly, right? And if you just ignore that and you go and look and it's been three months since someone's responded to that person, that's kind of a black eye. Did you have a question? Oh, wait, let me see. Okay, no. Sorry. And so <clears throat> what you want to do is make sure that you have the processes in place to make sure that you know you are taking care of your customers N no one's perfect everyone has a bad day and what i tell our clients all the time for instance in reviews um people people will look at people will put more weight into how you respond to a negative review than what that negative review says, right? So if you see a negative review online and you're like, oh, and you see no response, you're kind of like, whoa, it's a little shaky. But if you see a negative review and you see you see someone who has responded, you know, in a in a nice, um, fair way, uh, you're like, oh, okay, accidents happen, right? You're more forgiving, or Worse yet, if you see someone, a company that's going off on the person that has given them a negative review, you may think twice about going to that place because you're like, whoa, they're, they're kind of a loose cannon. So you've got to be real careful, you know, because a lot of clients, when we handle their reputation management, a lot of times, like with restaurants and stuff, they want to go off on the person. They're like, that person was blah, 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 and they, they did this and they did that. And I'm like, we understand. But you can't air that dirty laundry. You need to handle it professionally. Um, you know how you handle that situation will go much further than ignoring it or you know kind of going off the handle on it. So um, you know it's important that you know if you have something like a chat set up on your website but you're not servicing it, or you don't have the infrastructure to service it, it's better not to have that chat because you're doing your company an injustice by making someone that was mad even matter. So having these programs and having these um, processes in place, it takes some strategy and it, you, know, you wanna make sure that you're handling it the right way because it can be more important than the attract or the engage stage. And I think there's a there's a few examples, you know, of the company engagement responding to these that are that are kind of uh, at least from my experience, kind of stereotyped. You know, if any of you have ever dealt with cops and posted mm -hmm. something to their Facebook, you usually get some very generic response yes. that does not help you feel better about your situation. Yes. Right. Um, whereas other places where you'll see a bad review for a company or something, you'll actually sometimes get some of the other reviewers coming to the company's defense. So I'm yes. wondering how often you see that, you know, like, well, this person is clearly, you know, wrong, or they're clearly being unreasonable. You know, right. you've had a good experience with this product and brand. Yeah. And you actually have other people jumping on that support thing, right? Is that something that you see happen a lot? It is, and I think that's where the Delight Sage comes in, because those are the promoters. And it's kind of exactly what uh, I think we mean with this is that they'll come to your defense, they'll come, you know, they'll, you know, they'll vouch for you, they'll be your best salesperson. Yes. So I'm, I'm a digital immigrant or whatever. I never, never had a Facebook, never had any of those kinds of things. Um, the only ones of the reviews that I ever see is the one where somebody said this is the worst whatever. And the company came and took me to task with receipts. You know what I mean? So, well, actually, 
we, we have, you know, I remember when you came in and you did X and Y and G and so on and so forth. Is that not, I mean, is that, is that part of the strategy or is that just, hey, I, I think, I think that's an extreme case. Um, yeah. I think that's going to obviously be up to the owner of the business because they're putting their brand and reputation at stake. And some may want to do it to prove that if it's, if it's an extreme case, right? There's a lot of times where people who are reviewing like doctors or uh, under a fake name or they are not truly a customer or the experience really didn't happen. In those situations, the way we handle it is a little bit more tactful than what that. We'll say, thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, we researched our records. Doesn't show that you're a customer of XYZ, whatever the company is. Um, if, if our records are incorrect, please let us know. Boom, keep it plain and simple. We've responded, but then we red flag it and we tell Google, hey, Google, we have no record of this. This person, you know, is obviously not a customer of ours. Sometimes they take it down, other times they don't. Um, so, but in your, to answer your question, I think it would be an extreme case. I'm not saying it's wrong to do it. I think it's case by case. If this person has done a lot of damage to the business and and is hurting their business, then maybe that, you know, sort of like extreme cases take extreme measures type of thing. So it might, it might work in that case. Yeah, I saw one one time, and I don't, I forget which platform it was on, but it was, it's kind of funny. It starts out with like a one-star review out of five, and you have the person's name. And the company responds with something similar to what you were saying, which is, well, we don't have any record of you, you know, ever using our product or service. You know, is this made by mistake? And the response was something to the effect of, yes, you're correct, I'm sorry. I don't know how to take it down. Oh, <laughs> it's man. Whole street, and it's still there. Oh, <laughs> so it's going into the average. And if you read it, it's like, yeah, sorry, I made a mistake. I didn't. And I don't know why I gave this for you. <laughs> but it's there for everyone to read. <laughs> so just to go back to the, kind of the, the slide before this, though, so, um, when you're saying the light and kind of like creating disciples around your brand, um, I think with the age of social media and having influencers and stuff, a lot of that stuff is hard to measure. So when you're like having the delight phase or you know getting the customers attracted, like how are you measuring that? Just based off of um, some of your views, is it or you're posting stuff? Great, um, great question. Yeah. Um, that's great. So I see what you're saying. From the delight standpoint, we're actually. I'm referring more to your real customers, not necessarily influencers. So if we make someone happy at Blink Drawer, we have a we have a collision center, and she, the owner, loves us, and she's outspoken, and she's very uh, well known, and she's very social. She literally almost every week calls me. It's like I talked to so and so at dinner, and she's calling me because she wants to be a client. Blah blah blah. So she is someone I would categorize as a promoter because we've made her happy through our services. We continue to make her happy. We haven't done anything to not make her happy. And so she's going to um, spread the word, right? Where is it in? It's measurable in several ways. One, a lot of times I'll call her and say, Joey just recommended me. <laughs> Just recommended us to you. Another way is if they come on your site and they fill out a, uh, a sheet, we'll have um, you know where you got a referral, where you um, referred by anyone, if so, who, and so they can mark that down, and that becomes data, and so we can start segmenting by referral. Um, also, we track all of our calls, so if they call in and they mention referral, that will be marked in our system as a referral. So there are data points, trigger points that you can start segmenting um, how people found you. HubSpot has a sophisticated marketing software where we know for us and for all of our clients where every single account came from, like every single customer. Was it a Google search? Was it from Facebook? Was it a call? 
was a referral. So all of those things can be tracked. Um, sometimes things fall through. It's not like a perfect system, but it's pretty darn close to it. Um, unlike the traditional advertising where there was no trackable measures. And so we can, at the end of every quarter, every month, every quarter, we can see what their best attribution is and start investing more in those attributions and start to tweak what's not working. Um, and so they can, at the end of the day, see where their ROI is coming from. Is it organic search? You know, are most of their customers coming from searching on Google? Or are they coming from Facebook ads? Or are they coming from referrals from uh, other customers? So that's the way we uh, sort of track it. Influencers, obviously that's a whole new world. It kind of reminds me of Dan and I's old days where it was uh, like a sponsor, like a, um, a paid, you know, a uh, person that would kind of um, represent that brand, spokesperson. Um, and influencers are sort of like that, I guess, in a way. Um, I don't know, you guys tell me, can you see through the influencers or do you, do you think that's a viable uh, method? And I think a lot of it depends on the industry. I think it depends on if you like the influencer yeah. or if you trust them. Yeah. You know, like I don't, we're talking about the beauty industry earlier, but if it's somebody that you're like, okay, I, I like which, you know, this person puts forward or whatever. I like that, I don't know if this is a requirement now on social, but where people will say like ad yeah. or whatever. I appreciate that and I'm like, right. okay, I like that transparency. If I'm getting paid to talk yeah. to you about yeah. this product, and I will say, you know, like, like I have bought products. Not often, but every once in a while, I'll be like, yeah, okay. Because um, I bought something from them. Like, I just bought a moisturizer. I would say that, I would uh, echo that and say that it depends on, I guess, the influencer's integrity. Sure. And, and, and also what they've been doing before they actually endorse the product. So if it's been organic, they, yeah. if, if it's makeup, they've been doing makeup tutorials and they really like something they have to partner right with the company then that's you know that gives some integrity that makes sense. yeah yes is there any uh like internal measures that you have or like an industry accepted standard for the kind of cost versus efficacy of traditional advertising that's maybe ineffective versus kind of this inbound marketing approach oh absolutely how spot is done and nauseam a ton of research and Obviously, it, it's not, it, it is self-serving, but it's it's pretty in-depth research where uh, the ROI on inbound marketing is like 20 times the ROI on uh, traditional. Um, you know, it's just, there's something to be said about sitting down with a client at the end of the month and going, okay, you've spent $5,000 on marketing, you generated 500 leads, of those 500 leads, 20 became customers. What's the average lifetime value of your customer, which we'll figure out for each client, let's just say it's $1,000. Well, did I say 50 times $1,000, $50,000, you just made $50,000 off your marketing and you spent 5,000. So the ROI, your return on investment there is pretty substantial. It doesn't always happen that way, obviously, and it, it could be the opposite. But the more you invest in it, uh, the more likely your return on investment will be higher. Because it, it seems like in all those different, the, the attract and gauge to like, I know if you're like a small business owner, you can be doing a lot of blogs and doing a lot of posts. Yeah. But it seems like maybe the trend over the next number of years would be that the big boys will recognize that ROI differential and they'll just flood the zone. They'll they already out, have. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They'll, yeah. they'll, they'll outsource all that. And yep. Maybe, you know, like that's not a yep. bad thing. But, um, it's, it's, you're, you're exactly right. Like um, we have a, we have a mortgage company that's look, they have offices all over the state and it's hard to compete with like a rocket mortgage who has, you know, maybe 60 writers on their staff and that's all they're doing all day. And so they, you're, you're right, it's, it's caught up and it'll be interesting to see where it goes, but you can still be smarter and um, not
not work as hard as they are because they're probably just cut and pasting. Um, the consumer also wants content that's more customized to them um, and not just robotic AI content that's just spit out. Um, and so that's another thing to factor in. But um, I think that is another kind of branch of your question to his question is, you know, where is it going? Um, I think if you're in a competitive field, you need to really look at how you're going to separate yourself from others with this approach with inbound marketing. And you have to be smarter um, than the big boys. Um, and I would say concentration is the key to all economic success. The more focused you are on a certain segment, the better off you'll be. So if you can go dominate a certain segment, instead of being a uh, third party logistics, go be the one third, three PL third party logistics company that is known for athletic footwear. Just dominate in that narrow industry. So that when companies or like Nike or Adidas are looking for a third party provider, you're the one. There's no other question, right? You're the authoritative source in that field. So I think, you know, as more and more companies are doing it, that's what you're going to have to do to kind of stick out from the crowd. Can you tie that back to the timeline? So your website talks about being a marathon sprint. You also do that in the future when everybody's That's a great question. It's one of the, which is why we address it, it's one of the questions we get all the time. It's like, this is great, Jared. You know, it makes sense, but, you know, when am I going to see results? Like, when? When is all this gonna pay off for me? And unfortunately, there's no, it, it's dependent upon a lot of things. One being how competitive the industry is. Um, two, you know how much content and quality content you're putting out. Uh, there's a lot of variables, but in a you know in a perfect world, you should start to see results coming in at this, between the six and twelve month mark. You should start to see that chart start to kick up as far as Visit, visits engagement goes, um, and the quality of the lead is much better when you create. You can start to create, like one of the things when you go to our site, one of the first things on there is says what we don't do. And that's because we want to filter out anyone that's confused on what we do, because there's so much that you know, people think because we do digital marketing that we can fix their computer or we can fix their email or we're event planners or you know so we right away tell them or we're IT we're not IT I can't fix your email I don't know what's wrong with your computer um, so I we tell them that right away so that we're not wasting their time right um, and so the more streamlined you can be about this is what we do this is who we serve uh, this is what we don't do the better off you'll be you'll you'll not waste their time or yours so on the uh, one slide back to engage, I'm curious about where you, you talk about meeting people, customers sort of where they are, and you notice you, uh, you mentioned the buy phase. I'm curious, like when you're working with a client, do you all provide advice there? Like, look, based on what you're doing, I appreciate some of the clients you talk about. It doesn't sound like a lot of like transactional interface right then and there. But I think about those customers who. Like I'm a lot like I'm a lot more likely to make a purchase online if I can do it via PayPal because I don't like putting my credit card information in. Like I like using PayPal as that buffer sure. or Shop Pay. Sure. I'm just I'm, in that that feels like a customer experience decision. So what you're talking about there is the life of friction, right? And that comes in with the flywheel. So the more friction you put in your process in your flywheel, the less likely people are going to buy. From so she's 100% right. So uh, for us, we're trying to adapt to do even for business to business to do like certain online payments, uh, do it right there and then there so that it's frictionless, right? Um, everyone start, is used to doing the apps like in Starbucks or whatever now where you're not even having to speak to someone, it's frictionless, right? So the more, the less friction you have in your process, the better off you'll be. And I think that is another big part, kind of, 
um, answering Mike's question. I believe it was Mike. My vision's bad. I'm 50 and I can't see. That's good. Yeah. Mike yeah. brought up where do you see the world? Like, where is it going? And definitely, and this is not you know, earth shattering news, but you can see more and more, especially in restaurants and you know, COVID sort of kind of fast forwarded this uh, from a, a, a want to a need where. You can order something from just about any restaurant off your app. There's no friction there. You, can, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go in and speak to someone. The bad part of that is not the bad, but the challenge there is if there's friction built into the frictionless process. What I mean by that is there is one restaurant that will go nameless and this is just a personal experience but every time i order a jug of sweet tea the whole system is so discombobulated right and so when i go in to get it it's every time they'll go whoa, 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 what did you order and i'll say i ordered this jug of sweet tea and they're like oh we don't see that on the app and there's some bug in the system <laughs> so every time my frictionless process turns into a friction fill process, right? So you got to be careful as a company to not build more friction in your attempt to make the consumer process frictionless. The less friction you have in your business, the faster this flywheel spins. And as you make your business frictionless and make the consumer experience better, that flywheel continues to get faster and faster. And in the middle, you see growth as a company. The more friction you put into that flywheel, you know, having to input your credit card every time, or not having PayPal, or whatever it may be, or not accepting credit cards, the more friction you put into your process, the more it stops this flywheel going right and you have less growth um, and so that's why this flywheel model and methodology is so important to today's world because as consumers we expect a lot now because we can we can see where the world's going by going to a Starbucks app or Panera Bread or whatever it may be just stay at home with one touch order on yep. Amazon Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or delivery. Yeah. For food. Yeah. So our expectations of consume as a consumer has risen, right? And so as companies, we need to emulate that frictionless experience in our business, whether you're selling cranes or inbound marketing service or third party logistics, you have to make your process as frictionless as possible. And you know, by doing some of the things we we discussed. I'm just curious, as like as I guess the trend continues to move more towards frictionless and like less, I guess like points of contact. Yeah. Does it, I guess, present problems with like differentiating yourself amongst competitors? Because if they're all simplifying, it's a one-touch thing. You know, how do I how do I look different from all the other companies here? Yeah. It, it's right. it's it's a great question, and I think there's a lot of validity to that. And I think that's why you're seeing some companies taking more of a, a what's the word, like a cause approach to kind of separate themselves and and, and be more than just a company that serves chicken fingers, not to pick on raisin games. But you know, what is their cause? What are they doing outside of serving? Chicken beans. You're seeing that more and more, and they say, I don't know if this is the case or not, but like my kids' age and a little older, that generation, it means more to them, like what the company's doing outside of those those walls, right? What are they What are they about? What are they What's their commitment to, you know, whatever global warming or whatever? Uh, I think that's one way of separating yourself because you're right. The more the frictionless process becomes table stakes, for lack of better description, the, the more challenging it's going to become to separate yourself from everyone else. So how do you do that as a brand? Um, I think 
it's going to be more about like what else you do, um, how you're committed, even if it's just to the local community or whatever. I think that will have some validity. But you know, that's a it's a good good question. And I, I don't know if anyone has that figured out yet. <clears throat> Any other questions? One quick question I have for you guys, because I'm always curious about this. What is it about ad tracking that people don't like? <laughs> okay, but advertising is going to exist no matter what, right? You're going to get ads no matter what. So would you rather ads that are more contextually related? So you would rather win women's clothing ads no, go to? No, yes. like there's like an acceptable barrier what thirsty ads <laughs> in every second of every day in personal life. I don't get to pick what commercial thing to be on the Super Bowl halftime, right? Right. It's, it's just too invasive. I, I get that to a degree. Oh, well, but for see for me, if I'm shopping for a car, I'm going to every car site. Why? Yeah. Because then ads are served to me. And they come to me. And now I get to choose which one I want to see. Right. I still get emails. About a place to rent and right. Fort Smith, UK. And I, I spend minutes a day just deleting <laughs> shit out of my inbox. Right. So, bottom line, I want to be the active yeah. person. If I'm interested in something, I'll come You'll go get it. Okay. This, I, 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 I don't want to be the person again. I would rather try to spend money. So, I I so dangle something in front of me. And that's an absolute <laughs> that, that, that my perspective is not shared by everyone. No, but look, no one's right or wrong. Surveys, I don't fill out a survey either. Yeah. And the reason I don't fill out a survey is because I don't learn, I, I don't know how that, that information is going to be used. Yeah, no, I'm with you. So when, when Google's creating a profile of me, yeah. so that they can decide what I want and what I don't want or whatever, right. and again, if I want it, I will come find it. Gotcha. And I don't, and I think the alternative is, you know. I guess my thought is a little simpler. I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm like, if I'm going to see ads anyway, right? Because that's not going away. Unless you block all ads, and that's a whole different story. But if you're getting ads, wouldn't it be better to get ads that are more about what you want contextually? Doesn't that make sense or no? I my think that's good. Theoretically, that doesn't bother me. It's like the creepy, like, where you feel like they're listening. You say, so like, so like, I say, yeah. Yeah. say like the you, yeah. noodles or something, yeah. and then the <laughs> next day I've got like I seven you. pasta. Right. That's right. weird. I don't I agree. Like, I agree. Okay. They have an assignment in the class where you have to look at their like ad person like on Google, and there's part of that's like, huh, that's pretty good. Yeah. That's, and, and I don't mind getting things in those categories. Yeah. I have a very young child, and so like I don't mind getting pushed baby food or whatever. I'm like, okay, I didn't know they did that. Right. But then like it was it was interesting on the profiles like. I have nothing to do with the state of New Jersey. I have no idea why that's on there. It's like, I really don't care about that. Gotcha. Like, that part doesn't bother me. It's the, where did you hear me say that? That's yeah. weird. I don't want to engage with you as a company now. I just think it's interesting. I didn't want to go to tangent, but I'm always interested to hear what other people say. And I, I don't know if there's a, a right answer. I do think that Apple is trying to play the, the protector. And I'm sitting here thinking, Apple, do I really believe you're not going on and seeing what apps I'm downloading and what I'm doing on my phone? Mm -hmm. So you can be the gatekeeper and right. you can do it, but you can't, but everyone else can't. That's so, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. But at the same time, Google and Facebook, who their entire business model is out of marketing you. Yep. That I mean, yeah. I mean it's the lesser of two people. And I think Apple's gonna win that. I really think they yeah, are. They're gonna win it because they control the rails. You know, they control what we hold in our hand. Well, it's like it's like what's his name? Uh, the former Apple employee said, um, but he's like, hey, we take it. No, the other one. Tim Cook. No, Wozniak. Wozniak. Yeah, Wozniak. Whatever. He's like, yeah. you know, they they make the product, so they have a they have an industry that's outside of yeah. out of um, outside of. Uh, Taking advantage of you, and so I mean, they, I agree. Like, uh, uh, you know, they're a company; they're trying to make money or whatever. But they 
are not crippled in the knees by being more Never. genuine to yep. their to their uh, I'll like criticize it, but it's you know if I were in their shoes, I'd probably be doing the same thing. They own the rails, so they if you don't have a phone, you don't have access to everything else in the world, or unless you go to your computer. But they they guard the rails, man. They're they've got control. Yeah, so Joe was just saying, yeah, they're taking the responsibility for what's I guess what you're downloading. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. Like, who was the company that they were like, great, you don't get to have an app, we're taking you off the app store? This was like, that was, um, was, was it Fortnite? Game. Was it Fortnite? Yeah. Yes. I think it was Fortnite had a, a, a large, large lawsuit with that one. Um, and it, then it, well, it would go on a tangent. Basically, because Apple controls the rails, they make 30% off of every purchase. Of an wow. App. 30% off of everything you download. Think about that. And that's why companies like the Fortnite are like, wait up. We made this app. This is ours. And so there was a big battle. I don't even know who ended up winning. But uh, they still, they still, I don't know if it's 30% still, but it's up there. And so basically, if you want your app on Apple, which you do because they control the rails, right? 30%. I, I think the I think, I think there's a risk there, and I, when, you, when you do something like the one that Apple does that's really slimy is their proprietary repair. That is yeah. unbelievably, um, you know, like just and they're doing it for, for money, obviously, yeah. and and I, and I understand that, but they're creating space in the market where they're going to anger somebody enough. Yeah. They're just person by person. It goes, I'm not buying Apple, I don't care what they do. And then, you know, eventually that reaches a tipping point. Yeah. Hypothetically, maybe it never does. But, you know, I mean, there are companies uh, that, that were derailed, that owned everything, and are no longer in the marketplace. Yeah. You know, and, and so, yeah. and, and I think when you do that, it, it creates space for somebody else to come in. And, yeah, exactly. Well, Apple no longer provides charging blocks for your phone. Yes, because I got That's one, another thing got one for work yesterday yeah. and um, didn't come with a charging block. He said, oh, no, they don't, you have to get mine. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, too, after every, what, like, three or four years, they change the charging or oh, yeah. the, 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 the connection. Right, yeah. and now it's the USB-C. Yes, yes. Instead of the yes. Yes. Plug -plug yeah. you have to go buy the charging block. And then it's like <laughs> your car becomes obsolete because it's, you know, it doesn't have the updated plug in. Yeah. Yeah. Then you gotta go buy an adapter. I think in Europe they they yes. banned it there where it's now everything has to be uniform. So I don't know how just that just this past week I saw something on that one. It's gonna have to buy yeah. 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 the same. Yeah. 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 Well I didn't mean to go on a tangent guys, but I love hearing yeah. feedback and thank you for being honest and candid. I don't think you know, I think we'll We'll see what happens with all of that stuff. But thank you for your time. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's always a pleasure to have you in class, Jared. You've got some wonderful parting gifts from the MBA program for you. I tried Is to it season, season tickets? Yeah, yeah. 